Marcia Perla, and presenting with me are Emily True, Nicholas Rosamondo, and Agnes Hargis, along with Alexander Bello, Gudon Fu, Jenny Goodenham, Francis Hackenberg, and Al Osman, Ryan Sawyer, Ryan Chi, and Yolanda Zahn. Our mentor is Professor Ramesh Klapa, Chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. During this presentation, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about our prototype and the hardware and software that went into it. But I first want to set the stage with the problem we attempted to address. During this past four years, we've been focusing on the issue of blind navigation. Blindness is a worldwide disability affecting over 45 million individuals throughout the world. There are many difficulties associated with this disability, but one of the biggest is the inability to navigate through a new, unfamiliar environment. A sighted person entering a room such as this can very quickly go from one end to the other. But for a person who is blind, this task can take longer and runs increased risk of colliding into something. There are solutions to this problem, but for the most part, they're old tech answers such as the white cane and the guide dog. Newer solutions using computer vision techniques have been tried, but as we've discussed, for the most part, they're either unaffordable or inaccessible. This led us to the following research question. How can computer vision techniques and depth data be integrated to build a working navigational device for the blind? This is a very broad question. And so to make it more manageable, we just build it into three smaller project aims. First, we wanted to create a device that can augment the white cane's functionality instead of replacing it altogether, which is what some of those previous solutions I hinted at trying to do. We wanted a device that we, want, uh, that we built to be able to detect nearby obstacles and guide users around them. And finally, we wanted this device to be able to inform the user of the presence of stairs. I'll now turn it over to Emily to talk about our methodology and how it that. And then 74% were open to using the device. 
So we first ask them, what kind of feedback mode do they want? Because you want to give them enough information so that they can navigate safely through a room, but you don't want to completely inundate them with information. So we ask them, how do they want to receive information? And what we found was the majority of them wanted a combination of both auditory and tactile feedback. And that's something that we incorporated into our design. The next question we asked was, where do they want the device placed on their body? And we found that the majority of them wanted it either on the chest or on the waist with a slight uh, lean towards the waist. Unfortunately, we had to put it on the chest due to concerns with stabilizing the device and interfering with the weight gain. So equipped with this knowledge, we then started to design our prototype. And we picked out four pieces of hardware. The first was the Microsoft Surface. And the Microsoft Surface is where all of the computing is done. And we chose it because it's powerful, it's portable, and it's also compatible with our sensor, which is the Microsoft Connect. And the cool thing about the Microsoft Connect is that not only does it give us a color image, like a normal camera, it also gives us depth in, which adds a layer of complexity to our algorithm. Um, and then our third component was our custom hardware. And this was the haptic feedback system. So we had um, three motors, one on each shoulder, and then one at the center of the chest. And this provides feedback to the user about where obstacles are in the path. And our fourth component was the GoPro camera harness, which is used to mount the entire system on the user. So as you can see in this picture, and on Frank over here, um, this is our completed prototype, the final iteration of our design. Uh, the Connect sensor takes in information about the environment. It then sends that information to the Microsoft Surface Pro, which processes it and runs our algorithms on it. And then it takes that information and it sends it back to the user using haptic feedback as well as auditory cues. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk a little bit about our software design. Thank you, Emily. So before I talk about software design, I want to talk a little bit about the type of data we get from the Kinect and why we chose it as our sensor. The Kinect returns us depth data, which is uh, essentially a three-dimensional image. Instead of using color, it uses distance from the camera to generate its image. Uh, additionally, because it uses an infrared camera to generate this data, it works in low light environments. And the Kinect also comes in a package with several other sensors, including an accelerometer, which we actually do use, and a color camera. Uh, to further illustrate this, here are some images of what the data looks like. Uh, on the left, this image of a chair was taken with an infrared camera in a low light environment. And as you can see, you can still tell what's there, even though there's not much light in the area. On the right is an image of an optical illusion. This is an area that's painted to look like a waterfall, but it's actually flat. And if you took a color image of this, like is shown above, and ran it through an image segmentation algorithm, the algorithm would actually believe that there might be a waterfall there. But if you use depth data, because it's based on distance, the, al the same algorithm would segment it into the road that it actually is, rather than a with that data set in mind, we began our software design process by identifying the fundamental problems that we need to solve. Um, the first one of these is that the Kinect returns a very large data set, far too large to communicate to any one user. It would be an information overload, so we decided we need to narrow this data set down. And we asked ourselves, how do we do that? And then, once we've gotten this narrower data set, how do we use that data to navigate the user around the room? And our solution, was to create a map of the room, similar to what you would see on Google Maps, except on a much, much smaller scale. To do this, we use the tools provided by the Connect Software Development Kit and the data structures provided by the Open Computer Vision Toolset. In essence, we want to turn this, which is a picture of my kitchen, into this, which is the official blueprint of the same room. And in order to create this map, we evaluated several algorithms. Uh, we evaluate, evaluated an algorithm by Pedro Felsenswa, which looks for patterns that it recognizes 
and tries to associate those patterns with obstacles in the room. Then we evaluated an uh, algorithm by Derek Hoyam, which in fact does the opposite and looks for free areas in the room, areas that you can walk in. But our most successful algorithm was ransack, or random sample consensus, which takes a sample of random points in the room and uses those to try and fit claims to the flat areas, such as floors or walls. Unfortunately, all three of these algorithms presented us with the same problem. They didn't run in real time for us. We need that. We need to be able to run in real time for the device to be able to use. And we only have a tablet with what is essentially a laptop processor. So even though it's powerful for a tablet, it's not powerful enough to do this in real time. So what the team discovered was that, for as far as algorithms go, simple is better. And we wrote our own method to create the map, which I will walk you through now. We start with what the Kinect sees. On the left is the same color image of my kitchen. On the right is the Kinect image, the depth image. And what this image is, is each pixel in the image is shaded a different color of gray, depending on its distance from the camera. Darker pixels are farther away, and lighter pixels are closer. This sort of presents a problem, though, because it's still an image coordinates. Um, and to us and to our users, moving two pixels to the right doesn't really mean anything. To solve that issue, we transformed the data from a depth image to a point cloud. It's a similar three-dimensional data structure, except that it's in real-world coordinates, so that we can say two meters instead of two pixels. Uh, at the same time, because the connect on this mountain is wobbling around as the person walks, it's not always aligned with the floor. And so we use the connect accelerometer data, which shows us where gravity is, and gravity is always pointed toward the floor. And we use that to align the image with the floor. The result is something like this. This is a point cloud image, and all the blue points are on the floor, and all the black points can be considered obstacles because they are off the floor and you can't walk there. In order to create our map, we simply look at this data set from the top down. And on the left, you see what is our final map. On the right is the blueprint of my kitchen, and you can see based on the red lines that the features in the map and the features in the blueprint correspond to each other. Um, you also see some vertical and horizontal lines on this image. That is our image segmentation. That's how we break the image down into regions that we want to tell the user there are obstacles in. And the most important of those regions are the ones in the bottom middle of the image, those three regions. Those correspond to the left, right, and center motors on our feedback device. And as you can see, there are some black pixels in the left-hand region there. Um, black pixels correspond to obstacles, and so this image in particular would create a signal to the left-hand motor on the device, which would vibrate and tell the user to avoid that area. Now, because we know the height that these obstacles are off the ground, we can do a little bit more. We can actually do stair detection. And if one of those obstacles that we detect is approximately the height of a stair off the ground, the stairs we used in testing were about four inches off the ground, for example, we can then check to make sure it's wide enough to step up on, about two to three feet, and long enough, about one to two feet, so that there is room for the person to step up onto it. And if all of those conditions are satisfied, we can audibly announce to the user that there is a stair ahead. And now that I've described how our device works, I'd like to turn it over to Agnes to tell you how we test the device. Thank you, Nick. In the development of our final product, we went through several phases of testing, including haptic prototype testing, testing of the preliminary version of the device with sighted individuals who were blindfolded, and of course, testing with the blind. When we did haptic prototype testing, our main intention was to see if an individual's natural inclination was to move towards or away from the sight of vibration that they felt when using our device. This would help us figure out object avoidance capabilities for our device. So what we did was test with 12 individuals at University of Maryland in the biopsychology building in a hallway. And what we wanted to see was, for example, if they felt a vibration on the right side of the device, would they take it to mean, oh, this is the side where there's an obstacle, let me move the opposite way, or oh, the right side is the safe side, let me keep moving in this direction. Now we didn't test with blind subjects because there's such a limited pool to choose from anyway because this is a sensitive population. So we decided to save the blind contacts that we did have for final testing of our prototype. 
However, we did email and call blind individuals and when talking with them and asking them about their natural inclination when it comes to vibrations, it seems that they, a good majority of them want to move away from the side of vibration, which was the same result when we tested with these individuals in the hallway at the Biopsychology Building. So with this information, we had what we needed to create our first functioning prototype of the device. We knew what we needed to do with obstacle detection and obstacle avoidance, as said before. We put a motor on both the right side and the left side for vibration purposes, and we set it to mean that if both of the motors vibrated, that meant that there was an obstacle directly in front of the individual that they needed to avoid. So we started site up prototype testing also here at the university at the Biomotion Lab, and we had two versions of an obstacle course in which we tested 12 subjects here as well. And what we did was have each subject move once through one of the courses without the device, and then they would move through the other course with the device once as well. So this whole design was fully counterbalanced, meaning that we switched the course that each person would start off with to account for any differences that would occur because of the course we used. So as you can see from these results from the survey that we gave the sighted individuals after, the gray is agree and the dark blue is strongly agree. A good majority of them thought the device was accurate in navigating them away from an object, accurate when detecting an object in their path, and many people also thought the device was easy to use. So overall, positive results from our 12 participants that we had. So that was the first iteration of our device, and then we moved into the second iteration, in which we added basic stare detection, with, which would make mention an audio cue stating stare ahead. There was a center motor added, and this purpose was to take over the purpose of the right and left, both vibrating at the same, same time, to say that there was an obstacle ahead. Instead, this center motor would just vibrate. We also had the function of multiple motors vibrating at once if there were multiple obstacles in front of you, and the intensity of the vibrations getting more intense if you were getting closer to an obstacle. We also reduced the detection region, meaning, for example, instead of the device detecting obstacles up to six feet away, it would only detect obstacles up to three feet away because the sighted people that we tested, they thought it was an overload of feedback getting information from that far away. They just wanted information about obstacles closer to them. So then we went on to the second round of sighted prototype testing. We had obstacle courses, one like this, um, where it was complete with boxes, overhanging obstacles, chairs, and a raised platform about four inches off the ground for stair detection. So through this testing with the nine participants that we had, we realized several problems that we needed to fix with the device. One of them being that many people didn't like that it had multiple vibrations. They thought it was an overload of feedback and quite frankly confusing, so they wanted more distinct vibrations. So now we move into our final iteration, in which we improve the stair detection capabilities, and we also simplified feedback in the form of only one motor vibrating at a time, only one intensity of the motor, and we re-increased the detection region, because even though the sighted individuals that we tested with while blindfolded didn't want to know about obstacles that were up to six feet away, blind individuals use canes which are about six feet long, and so they want to know about the obstacles that are that far away. We also realized that we had to calibrate the angle of the connect separate differently for each person that used the device because an individual's height affects how well they can detect obstacles. All right, so this is where we tested, once again, in the Biomotion Lab. As you can see, this setup is pretty simple because the main things that we want to see, as mentioned before, are its functionalities with detecting stairs and also detecting overhanging obstacles. So as you can see from the results of the four participants that we tested with, um, each of those lines represents a participant. When they did the run without the device, it took them an average of around 50 seconds. And then when they first did the run with the device, it took them a lot longer sometimes. But as soon as they beat the learning curve and did the run with the device again, it looked like they went back to the baseline, showing more comfortability with the device, as much comfortability as they did with just the cane and the device alone. And it's also worth mentioning that even though we didn't have 100% accuracy with this, there were promising results with both detection of overhanging obstacles and stair detection. After each one of the individuals that went through this course completed it, we also had them complete a survey called PIAX. 
MPS stands for the Psychosocial Impact of Assistive Devices Scale, and it tests individual self-esteem, adaptability, and competence when using a navigational aid. So it's on a scale of negative three to three, uh, negative three meaning negative effects, and positive three meaning a positive effect. But um, as we see from our results, it was overall positive, but we need to, that's promising, but we need to stay clear of the fact that we only had four participants, meaning we didn't have much statistical significance. Now I'm going to hand it over to John to talk about future directions and limitations. Thank you. Um, now the question is, now that we've shown you our prototype and what it's capable of, we should, I want to take a few minutes to discuss what its limitations are and areas for improvement. The Kinect, like any sensor, has a maximum range of vision to detect obstacles, but it also has a minimum range. Anything within one foot of the device will not be detected, which is a key parameter to keep in mind. Their detection is functional, but because we're using off-the-shelf components like the GoPro chest harness, there's a lot of wobbling associated with it. This led to the cases of false positives with their detection. The Kinect relies on infrared data for the depth imaging, therefore it's only functional indoors, away from the sun. And because of the uh, surprising winter weather we had, there's only a limited amount of time and participants that we were able to test for. Question now is where do we go from here? We'd like to design a custom mount for our device that will offer the greater stability that I mentioned before. We'd like to upgrade the sensor technology used and integrate it with object recognition. This would allow us to identify the kind of obstacle that a person has encountered. We've done some preliminary work from the scripts from the University of Washington, and the results are promising. Finally, now that the winter is safely over, we'd like to continue testing with a larger number of participants and also get a better sense of the kind of preferences for how. What we've done through this project is address a very important issue within the blind community, that of navigation. What we've done through this project is try to use depth data bundled into a small compact package known as the Microsoft Connect, as we showed here. The results, while not well, statistically insignificant, are very promising and we are encouraged with the results. In short, what we've done is we've taken the potential of a gaming device and transformed it into a tool that we believe can improve the lives of a disadvantaged population. Before we open up the floor to questions, we'd like to thank our phenomenal mentor, Professor Rama Chalapa, our consultant, Dr. Chandra Tang, our librarians, Robin Dasner, Jim Miller, Lee Stearns, our graduate assistant, the entire Gemstone staff, both past and present, the blind support organizations we've been privileged to work with, our discussion committees here, and finally, to you, the entire audience, for coming out and supporting us on this Friday afternoon. Thank you for your time.
But I do plan to understand how you would get all obstacles, including ones that are not overhanging, like a pedestal, because you protect everything from the ground. Um, and I would think that, I, I guess my impression is that the some who want are, are much more interested in overhanging obstacles which they can't detect with a cane, uh, whereas the obstacles they can detect with a cane, maybe they don't want to be alerted to. Okay, 
we're going to open it up for questions from the whole room, and there's lots of different angles we can take, so don't feel shy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Patrick Mussman, I'm a uh, mechanical engineer, and I was wondering if you had any plans in, uh, say, future directions of using other uh, sort of depth scanners like um, time of flight or uh, like two can parallax systems. So the question that was asked is if we're going to investigate any other depth cameras like time of flight. And the answer is yes, we are. That's one of our future directions. And the sensor that we're particularly interested in is actually the Kinect's uh, father, the uh, Asus Xdion. This is a device that has a, a form factor similar to the Kinect, but it's actually smaller. So our harness system would actually be functional with it. The question that we are particularly want to look at is that if we have the same access to the software development kits that we did with the Connect. But yes, we're definitely going to take it in that direction. Yes, sir. Question in the second row, Rick. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Dario, and I have a retinal implant. Uh, and I would, uh, first of all, I would agree with the, the gentleman who suggested that uh, it is very limiting, and I would project that more as an orientation device rather than a mobility uh, device. My question for the for the group first, I, I participated in the obstacle course and was very impressed. Um, have you or considered a that this prototype would eventually be some kind of a wearable device, be it uh, wrist, uh, even a, a glass, uh, the glass.